Good morning. This is the first of our uh, of Good Friday morning services, so thank you for all making this a good turnout. We'll, we'll continue the same service this afternoon as well, too, and this gives opportunity for people who aren't always able to travel um, at night, uh, and so we welcome you. Uh, as you notice, our service continues picking up with the theme from last night. Um, good Friday and Monday, Thursday are seen as one service. We will then... Um, after our sermon, we will then close our service by hearing the seven words of Jesus from the cross. And then we will also then depart in silence. We rise and begin. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We sing. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Tell me, you who hear him grow, was there ever grief like this? Friends through fear his cause disowning, foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him, none would intervene to save but the deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that he was oppressed and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. You who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great. May view its nature rightly, hear its guilt may estimate. Mark the 
sacrifice appointed. See who bears the awful load. It's the word the Lord's anointed. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Our title, the title of our sermon is Jesus on Trial. What's the most famous trial in the last hundred years? Was it the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trials in Tennessee, after which our nation allowed evolution to be taught in public schools? Was it the Nuremberg Trials, where Adolf Hitler's leaders were brought to trial and had to stand because of the atrocities that they had committed? Or possibly it was the O.J. Simpson trial, where the famous black gloves. Or was it Timothy McVeigh? You remember, he was tried for killing 168 Americans in Oklahoma. Possibly it was Martha Stewart, as she stood trial as well, too. But what are those famous words that are stated in every trial? Those familiar and important words that we always hear. One of them is innocent. The other is guilty. And the other word is free. Every trial hinges on these three words. Innocent, guilty, and free. Let's use these words to understand the most famous trial ever. One for the ages. It was the trial of Jesus Christ there in Pilate's judgment hall. The accused Jesus and the accusers, the Jewish leaders, the judge is Pontius Pilate. Innocent, guilty, and free. Innocent, that's Jesus. For Pilate knew that he was not deserving of death. Three times he asked him many things. Are you guilty? Are you a king? Do you have an army? Throughout the Passion, we're told that Pontius Pilate's title was governor. He was the one that oversaw the judgment. He had the power to release and set free. He had the power to declare one innocent. He had the power to declare one guilty. We know that Jesus was innocent because Scripture tells us that he was without sin. He broke the very power of the devil into the ranks of the everlasting evil empire, and yet he was still innocent. In spite of all of this, Pontius Pilate asks the question, is Jesus innocent, guilty? You may recall that that is Barabbas. Pontius Pilate always followed the custom of releasing one popular prisoner at the direction of the crowds. And so when he asked the crowd, who do you want me to release? They said, Barabbas. History tells us that Barabbas was a Jewish Robin Hood. He would attack the Romans, give to the poor, and he would lead an uprising. He was what we would call a political star. And now, as an insurrectionist, he was captured. Barabbas wasn't just a petty thief. He was seen as a revolutionary. He was one that you would not want on the streets because he would rival the crowd and cause people to carry out vengeance against the Roman Empire. And yet he was guilty. He transgressed sin. You know, guilt can also be a place upon us, can it? I mean, think of what Paul says. We were born into sinfulness. We are prone to wander and flee from the Lord and do what we want. We're blind by our, this age that we live in. Sometimes we are considered to be the least. And yet, even though we're guilty, the Bible deals with this thing called sin. Sin isn't regarded as a lapse or a stumbling block. You need to understand that, that sin is really a coup against God. It's a desire to be number one in life, to do what we want, to rebel against the rules that God has established. Ever driven past the speed limit? You've broken God's law. Ever cursed at your mother or father? ever spoken ill of your wife or your husband? These are all the things that we simply do day in and day out that cause us to be guilty. Just think about our life here in church. We want to live at peace with one another, but it's very hard, especially as 
We live out our lives in the world. We see it on the television. We see it in our own lives. It's true what Isaiah says. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own ways. And our ways are toxic. At times we flirt with danger. We turn away from God. We want to be the one who is in charge. And yet, all the time, like Barabbas, we deserve the wages of death. We're not innocent. We're guilty. But free. See, that's Barabbas, isn't it? The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again saw that the two, one was guilty and one was not, and yet he was still persuaded. He famously said to the crowds, I wash my hands of all of this. Palm Sunday, you may remember, is when Jesus entered Jerusalem. The crowds honored him. They called him king. And now the voice of the crowd was calling for his condemnation. But Barabbas was free. Free to live his life the way he wanted. That's surely us, isn't it? You see, Christ endured the nails, the mockery, the spears. He did this for justice, God's justice. Even yet, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's why God placed sin upon Jesus. More accurately, Jesus becomes the substitute for what you and I deserve. In his life and in his death, he gave to us a life-changing gift. My sins and your sins were cast upon Christ. And there we receive the mercy of God. The Lord sets prisoners free. The law of the spirit of life has set us free. Just think about the outcome of history. In this most famous trial, our Savior liberates us, sets us free from the condemnation of our sin. He sets it all free. We don't have to worry about the future. No one's coming there to take away our freedom. Instead, God bestows and continues to give us freedom. Innocent, guilty, and free. They're the most important words in any trial. And what would you say to this life-giving freedom? Yes, you are free. For if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. That's us, like Barabbas, and by faith forevermore. Amen. At this time, we will hear our seven words. You may remain seated as we read and hear this liturgy. What was the day of preparation? It was the day of preparation of the Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away. Take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Two other men, both criminals, were also laid out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Almighty, Father Almighty, the shadow of your Son's cross falls upon us. The second word. The people stood watch, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said to him, He saves others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, 
save yourself. There was written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminals rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Lord Jesus, while you hung on the cross, you showed mercy to the dying thief. With that mercy, look on us also. We pray, and at our last hour, comfort us with your promise that we will dwell forever in paradise with you. cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Lord Jesus, while you suffered the agony of the cross, you remembered in love your sorrowing, sorrowing mother. With that same love and pity, bless all parents, especially those whose hearts are torn by the loss of lo loved ones or burdened with worry over their children. In your mercy, gather all within the peace of your cross, so that parent and child may love each other as they also love you. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all of the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud 
voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling Elijah. Heavenly Father, your son cried, why have you forsaken me? In time of trial and suffering, do not turn away from us, but give us your presence and your power that enables us to endure whatever may be set before us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet and receives a prophet's reward, and anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Later knowing that all was now complete, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Lord Jesus, you endured not only spiritual anguish, but also physical pain on the cross in our place. We thirst for healing that only you can provide. Strengthen us to carry our burdens and to endure our sufferings by the grace of your holy example, always giving you thanks for your love. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, 
That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats or calves, but he entered the most holy. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom, to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. You did not stop short of finishing the task given to you by your Father. Complete in us everything you intend for us, so that as children of the Heavenly Father, we may live for his glory. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Open our eyes, Lord. Stir our souls, Lord. Lead us, Lord. Loving Jesus Christ, as you gave your life on the cross in our place, you commended your spirit into the loving hands of your heavenly Father. Give us the grace to trust in you for all things. When our last hour comes, grant us peace, that we may close our eyes with confidence, knowing that we also will dwell forever in the hands of our heavenly Father. <laughs> 